Now then, for today, we have Emily LaFalchere. She is an entomology graduate student and the lab manager at Dr. Carrie Minter's lab. They focus on the biological control of weeds. Um, this is a very important lab and it's located in Indian River Research and Education Center down in Vero Beach or over in Vero Beach or up in Vero Beach, depending on where you are. And Emily, I feel like I wanted to talk about this subject because back when I worked in the landscape industry so many years ago down in Miami-Dade County, I sold a lot of earleaf acacia. So I feel like this is my penance. This is I'm trying to right the wrongs of a younger Wendy back in the day. So I'm sorry, everybody, for selling these trees back in the day. Also, um, you know, I really thought it was a South Florida problem. I thought it was um, Palm Beach, Martin, Vero, you know, back in the swamps over there. And then I didn't realize until I was driving back from Fort Myers and Naples last week that it's on the West Coast, too. I was shocked. It's in the swamps over there. And I'm like, great. This is why we're having this webinar, because this is a problem and it's a real growing concern. So I'm going to go ahead and stop share and we are going to welcome Emily LaShare to our presentation today. And thank you so much for being here. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? We can see it perfectly. I can. Yes. Okay. All right. So, and everyone can hear me okay. If you can't, um, let Wendy know and we can try to get that fixed. But yeah, that's very interesting to hear that you were selling early Cicasa, but you know, there are things that we find out after so many years, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it today. But um, Wendy gave you a brief, gave everyone a brief background about me, um, but a little bit more. So, yes, I am the lab manager for the Mintier Biological Control of Weeds Lab um, at the Indian River Research and Education Center. Uh, even though it's named Indian River, we're located in Fort Pierce. Um, and I've been working with invasive species since 2015. So we're going on nine years this year. So I've been doing this for a long time. And at some point I decided to be a glutton for punishment. And I went back to, I'm gonna be finishing my master's here in a couple months. So, um, but I think one of the important things to talk about today is what makes something invasive? Because we had a lot of people putting names of plants in the chat that were native. So there's a difference between native plants that are weedy and invasive plants. So um, invasive species are any organism that are not native to the specified geographic area. So in our case, Florida, and they have to cause harm or are likely to cause harm. And that could be to the environment, to the economy, or to human health. And so these invasive species, they come in all different shapes and sizes, right? So I know everyone is familiar with the Burmese pythons that are in the Everglades that are just destroying e entire ecosystems. Um, here in Fort Pierce, we've got issues with the, these Ar uh, Argentinian black and white tegus. And I am positive everybody in the southeastern United States has come into contact with fire ants at least once. So these are just examples of the, the range of invasive species we have. In Florida, there's no shortage either. And so how do these invasive species get introduced? How do they get here? And so I say that introductions happen on all ends of the spectrum, um, intentionally and unintentionally. And I think one of the most common um, occurrences of this is people bringing in plants as ornamentals. So we've got lantana, um, the invasive lantana, beautiful flowers, but again, it spreads uncontrollably, it's an issue. And then on the right, uh, the picture on the right with the red berries, you see Brazilian pepper tree, which I see a lot of you have issues with also. Um, so not so much, you know, people don't keep <laughs> ornamental things as plant or plants as pets, but um, as you saw with the Burmese pythons and the tegus and um, the picture here, the giant African land snail, these are all things, results of the pet trade and people, um, regular people who think that this snail is really beautiful, um, they 
sometimes don't fully inform themselves of the amount of time and work that's needed to keep these things living and thriving. So they just decide to dump their responsibilities um, in their backyard. And that's how we end up with these invasive species. And so another thing that a lot of people don't think about is bringing com uh, agricultural commodities or plants from other parts of the world or even the United States. So that's why uh, Florida has instituted um, this, this outreach, the Don't Pack a Pest program. And it's a lot of times why you see these dogs in airports sniffing luggage and sometimes why people, they may think they're being harassed to throw fruit and vegetables in their suitcases away, but this is all very important because there could be insects or uh, pathogens even that are hiding in these seemingly harmless goods. And so we also have a lot of accidental introductions. So um, the zebra mussel up north in the Great Lakes, they think came in on um, in ballast water from ships. Um, you see the picture of the dog on the left. He's got stickers, plant stickers of some kind all over him. And if the um, pet owner doesn't clean those off where, where the dog collected those after running in the field and he takes them, takes them home and picks them off and throws them in the yard, he is just, he or she has just spread these plants, um, to another area. So, and of course, um, I don't know how many people have heard about emerald ash borer in the northeastern United States, but this is also one of those reasons they tell you to buy your firewood where you burn it. Uh, in Florida, at least in South Florida, we don't have very many opportunities to uh, have bonfires. So, you know, the moving firewood, I don't think is a huge issue down here, but it's still something worth thinking of because um, it's not something you think of that firewood could be carrying invasive species. And then another big one is uh, these things come in accidentally through contaminated agricultural commodities. So uh, on plant, on fruit, seed, um, on shipping containers, uh, all of these hitchhikers. And you know, Florida has a little over 30 ports of entry between airport and physical um, boat ports where these things come on to. And the USDA and US Customs have a lot of inspectors located at each one of these, in each one of these regions doing inspections um, to kind of try to stop, stop these things before they actually get in. And so we talked a lot about, you know, how the different ways that these things can get into Florida, um, but wh why is this a problem? Well, all of these creatures, and I'm going to be speaking specifically about plants because that's kind of my area, is they all have qualities that make them incredibly competitive. So they don't, when they come to Florida, they don't have the natural enemies that are suppressing them and keeping them in check like our native plants do. So they're able to outcompete our native species for all of the essential stuff that they need to grow. So water, nutrients, light, and space. So this in turn reduces plant diversity. It can degrade wildlife habitat, which if you're familiar with gopher tortoises, um, Brazilian pepper is an issue in gopher tortoise habitat. Uh, can degrade water and soil quality, alter nutrient cycling, especially in the case of ear leafy acacia, that is a nitrogen fixer because it's a legume. And uh, not only that, they're very costly to manage. And one of the big management methods that we use is chemical control. And so I was born and raised in Beer Beach, Florida, which is just a couple minutes north of Fort Pierce, where I work. And we are right on the Indian River Lagoon. So I'm very familiar with water quality and the issues that we've been having as a result of runoff of chemicals into our lagoon. And so uh, one of the first examples of a South Florida invasive species that we have 
and many of you are familiar with is Brazilian pepper tree. So this is a project that I'm currently working on. Um, so it's native to South America, coastal Brazil, and it was in, imported as an ornamental in the 1800s. Um, the seed being bright red and beautiful um, is what gave it its name of Florida holly or Christmas berry because these seeds ripen and turn red around Christmas time. So it kind of looks like mistletoe. Um, but these seeds are spread easily by birds and other frugivores, and they germinate. I mean, the germination rate is outstanding. So and not only that, I'm sure many of you try in your efforts to manage this plant have found out that it is an irritant. So when you break branches and any of the sap gets on your skin, um, it can leave rashes. Um, it for me, when it's flowering, it causes very bad allergies. I find myself stuffy and sniffling the whole time. Um, but it's because it's related to poison ivy and poison oak. So there's one of the, just another great thing about Brazilian pepper tree, right? Um, but those of us that have seen it have really seen how quickly it's able to create these dense monocultures, these dense walls of Brazilian pepper tree. And I see that a lot on the turnpike. But um, I don't know if anyone has been keeping up with our biocontrol, but here's your update. <laughs> a few years ago, we had uh, one agent, a biocontrol agent released to help us try to combat our Brazilian pepper tree. So this is the Brazilian pepper tree thrift. They are a host specific uh, insect that feeds on the growing tips of the thrip or of the tree, excuse me, and causes the tips of the plant to die back. And in turn, the flowering rates are reduced and berry production is reduced too. Uh, we're still working on studies trying to kind of get numbers to back that up, but that's just what we've seen in the field. So an aquatic plant that maybe some of you might be familiar with is water hyacinth. And this plant is probably one of the world's most invasive aquatic weeds. Um, being a native to South America, it was introduced again as an ornamental in the eight, late 1800s. And these plants are able to block entire waterways. And they, they create these very dense mats that make water almost in unnavigable. And so they also reduce dissolved oxygen concentrations. Um, the amount of sheer biomass of these plants that are produced, especially when being managed, um, because the common management method for these plants is herbicide, you've got tons of dead plants just beginning to rot and falling to the bottom of these waterways. And I mean, it, it, it's just the, an incredible volume of biomass that's produced by these plants. Um, but luckily we do have several biocontrol agents um, that have been released since the seventies for these plants. Uh, we've got two weevils, there's a moth, and of course the, these plant hoppers on the right, which have been doing a, a very good job so there have been a couple uh, areas of infestation where they are demand they're being managed pretty well by these biocontrol agents alone. And then another one I saw a lot in the chat today, uh, potato vine or air potato. So this is uh, another one that is the bane of a lot of homeowners' existence because this was also brought in as an ornamental because it's beautiful. It's got these nice beautiful heart-shaped leaves. Um, and they, it grows quickly, so great. It covers up my fence. It's a nice, uh, a nice wall of air potato that I don't have to see my neighbor. But, you know, very quickly people find out that the, this plant is just really aggressive. I mean, it can grow up to eight inches a day, and it was introduced to the U.S. twice. So first in Alabama, and then again in South Florida, and it's widespread in pretty much every state in the southeastern United States. And I know a lot of you have issues with this 
but now I'm sure a lot of you have participated in the air potato challenge that was um, done through our lab and through the St. Lucie County Extension, where we were working with homeowners and extension agents to uh, release this biocontrol agent, the air potato beetle. And since their release in 2012, it has resulted in these, this really beautiful massive reduction in vine biomass in the production of the potato bulbul and the spread of the vine. And so we're still learning from this program and a lot of homeowners, I know I'll get questions about how can I get more? Uh, where can I get more beetles? And the answer is that this program has been so successful that they're no longer mass producing these beetles, but there are, there are resources that you can go to to help you figure out um, if the beetle is actually present uh, in, on your property. And if not, um, we actually encourage that homeowners go to areas where there are beetles and take them and move them to their properties. So that's something that as long as you can get onto the land legally, that's something you are totally allowed to do. And there are so many more, right? Like these, I, I gave you details about three that I have worked with. And there's just so many more because Florida is a zoo of invasive species. And I know a lot of these are very familiar and the bane of some of your guys' existence. And I've worked with a lot of these also, but the real star of the show today is going to be Earleaf Acacia. So this is um, a plant in the Fabaceae family. So it's a legume. It's related to a lot of the different, um, a lot of other legumes that we enjoy. It's native to Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia. And it's an evergreen tree. And it can grow, the conservative estimates are about, they say up to about 15 meters, but really I've seen them much taller. So we say about 15 to 30 meters. And um, for those of us working in other units, that's about 5,200 feet, but still quite tall. So they were introduced to Florida as an ornamental in the 1930s. And they've also got these properties, we call them uh, these allelopathic properties. So they are chemicals that are basically chemical warfare that are exhibited by this plant where it has secretes chemicals into the soil, or that is the result of leaves breaking down on the soil that make it so the environment around this plant is inhospitable for any other plant species. And this also aids this plant in, its, um, in being invasive. And so how can you recognize your leafy casa? So once you've seen, once you've seen it once, you really get the idea. And to me, it's easiest to find during the flowering and fruiting period. So it has these really interesting sickle shaped leaves. They're flattened um, and it has very distinct flowers and seeds. So the flowers grow on these long spikes. They might be three or four inches long. Um, they have an aroma to them that is not, I can't describe it, but I can smell an early facade tree before I actually see it. And, but I think the most distinct feature of this plant are the seeds. So um, we'll go into the seeds next. But again, here are the flowers. I mean, it has a lot of flowers. And what, one of the things about this plant that makes it so invasive is that it has a long flowering period. So the longer these flowers are on the plant, the more time that they have for pollinators to visit them and pollinate. And then the more fruit it produces. So after the flowers are pollinated, they turn into these twisted green pods that resemble kind of like an ear. Um, so why, why we don't use other common names like ear pod, acacia, um, I don't know. So the leaves don't look like ears to me, but <laughs> so after the seeds have ripened, they turn brown and they pop open and the seeds dangle from these little orange 
um, aerials and they look kind of like the picture on the right. So here's some close-ups of the seeds at 30 times magnification. Um, I think the most distinct feature is the seeds and how they hang from those brown pods uh, from the little orange um, feathery. It's very light. So they're probably dispersed pretty easily by birds and other animals because uh, from what I've been told, this little orange aerial is sweet. And populations are booming. So um, some of you may be noticing this plant more than ever. Being introduced in the 30s, there was a little bit of a lag period. So we had a small population on the West Coast. We saw it on the East Coast a little bit. Um, and a couple years when we first took on this project, Fort Pierce, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, but probably right around here, was one of the first areas that was kind of the northern part of the range for this plant. But in recent years, it, it has really exploded. And I mean, the, the number of sightings have just exploded, doubled, tripled. Um, so, and it, it's as far north as the Kissimmee River now. And this plant, we think the seeds move along waterways. Um, so the fact that it's creeping into the Everglades, creeping up into the waterways in central Florida, it should be alarming to everybody. So current management methods, basically we've got what we've got for anything. We suggest that if you see a seedling, you pull it up and burn it or dispose of it in a way that you think is right. Um, taking out mature trees if you can and chemical control. So cut stump uh, treatments with triclopyr, uh, the different formulations of triclopyr. And these are uh, recommendations from the Center of, Center of Aquatic Invasive Plants. Or we can just feed them all to the giraffes in the Lion Country Safari Zoo, like they have been doing. So Lion Country Safari is doing their part in trying to uh, cut down the early vacation in that area. But uh, in a perfect world, we would all have giraffes in our backyard, but uh, not in this world. So. What our lab specializes in is biological control of invasive weeds. And right now we are testing two classical biological control agents. And here's just a, a primer for those of you who might not be um, sure about biological control. And I'm gonna use Brazilian pepper tree here as an example. So in the native range of Brazilian pepper, the picture on the left, the Brazilian pepper tree plants are much smaller. Um, they, because they're managed by a community of multiple insects and other things that have evolved over time to eat this plant. So they've got a community of local generalists and specialist herbivores. And so these plants aren't a nuisance. Um, but when the plant escapes from these natural enemies or the things that otherwise control it, they begin to grow uh, just out of control, like you see in, in Florida on the right. The plants are much bigger um, and they can spread. So the goal of biocontrol is to take the natural enemies from the native range, so in this case Brazil, and reunite them with the plants that we have in Florida. And th this is not done willy-nilly. Um, this is not the same biocontrol that people might think of when they think of the cane toad. Um, we regulations have changed a lot since the 60s and 70s. So cowboy biocontrol is no longer. So this is a very long regulatory process. And we take, myself included, we take a lot of pride in making sure that we're making good decisions for Florida's environment, because the last thing that we want is to release an agent that would feed on anything else besides the intended target. So one of those agents is um, Calamella intamorata. So Earleaf acacia is from 
the Ehrlichia case that has invaded Florida is from the northern part of Australia in the Queensland and Northern Territory areas. So this beetle feeds on um, the growing tips of the plants, the new leaves. Uh, the picture on top is obviously an adult beetle. They are beautiful. They've got lime, they're bright lime green. The wings are this fuchsia color. Um, they're super charismatic. And they were imported to our quarantine lab in 2018. So right now we're working on host range studies. And when I say host range, this is where we're testing this insect on all of the plants, all of the related plants of Florida. So Florida does not have any native acacias, but we do have things that used to be called acacias like Bachelia, um, Acaceella, and uh, other closely related things like Camicrista, um, your partridge pea, stuff like that. So we have been conducting plant or tests, putting these insects on these test plants in quarantine and monitoring them to see if they feed or develop on these plants. And so far we we're about three quarters of the way done with our test list and we have not had feeding on any other plants except for Eurlyficacea. So this insect is extremely host specific and we're hoping to uh, submit a petition for their release later this year. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't mean we send an email and then two days later, we get the thumbs up from the federal government. The federal government moves at the federal government's uh, rate. They move at their own speed. So um, I think a more reasonable timeline for release of these agents is 2026 or 2027. But we are still, we're doing our due diligence to make sure that it's safe and the government is doing their part in that too, looking over all of our testing and making sure that we've dotted our T's and, or dotted our I's and crossed our T's, excuse me. A second agent that we have is Trichlogaster. It doesn't have a name yet. Uh, it's being identified by a taxonomist in Germany right now. It's a very cute wasp, uh, a bud galling wasp. So anywhere where the leaves grow out of the stem of the plant, they will lay their eggs inside of that. And um, one of the pictures here you see of this, this bud um, open, there, that's a little immature larva in there. It develops within the plant and basically acts as a nutrient sink in the plant. So um, this wasp doesn't sting people. It doesn't harm anyone. Um, and they are very, very good at destroying these plants. Um, so this is the PhD work of Sarah Salgado, who is pictured below or in the, in the picture on the bottom of the slide. This is her PhD work. Um, so we're in, they are a couple years behind our calamella um, leaf beetle, and they, um, we should be getting permits for those a little bit later, but host range testing is a, a lot further behind. So this is one to keep an eye out for because they're really, really cute and charismatic. They do a lot of damage, and um, they've also been successful biocontrol agents for a cases of other countries, too. So we're staying hopeful for these guys. And so I've talked a lot about invasive species and I, it's easy to feel very overwhelmed by um, what seems to be an insurmountable task. And you might be wondering how you can help. So um, Erlificacea is spreading rapidly. Um, if any of you travel the turnpike, take, keep an eye out around this time of year for the trees with the brown pods on them. These plants, I have, it is very concerning. The, traveling from Fort Lauderdale to Fort Pierce, we have collaborators in Fort Lauderdale and I take the turnpike to go down there and it's astonishing to see how quickly this plant has spread along waterways. Um, but part of our research means we need accurate distribution maps. I, I don't think that the maps that we have right now are accurate. I think it is much more widespread. And 
to have accurate maps would aid us. Uh, it would just be one of the best things that we could have because it can help us inform control activities, help us plan for the best places to release biocontrol agents. And not only that, but after biocontrol agents are released, it'll help us monitor the spread and impact of these insects. So um, this is a poster that we have that would be coming to many extension offices near you. Um, there's a QR code that is going to be coming up later on in the presentation if you have a smartphone and you use iNaturalist. Um, we have an iNaturalist project where we are recruiting citizen scientists. We need people that have an eye for nature, like all of you, to help us in kind of getting those pinpoints on the map of where these plants are. And so if you have a smartphone, you can take it out right now and um, scan this QR code, or there is a link at the bottom of the screen, take a picture of it and visit it later, or you can search in iNaturalist, um, search for the project Ear Leaf Acacia in Florida. And I can provide information later on um, to Wendy to give to all of you if you're interested in joining. Um, that would be a huge help to us. And if you want to learn more about invasive species in general, um, the UF Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants is an excellent resource. Um, they have, their website has all these, they've got lists of both invasive and native plants. So in this picture you see um, fog moss, they have um, where you can click it and it has resources. So like the bog moss here, they have line drawings available for you to look at and help you identify your plants. Um, for Malaluca, they've got a recognition card and line drawings and the recognition cards look just like this. Um, so this is an example for Acacia, something you can print out and keep with you. So if you do a lot of uh, nature hikes in natural areas and you wanna keep an eye out for it, you can just keep this in your pocket. And um, you can also visit our website to keep up with our biocontrol projects. And um, so our lab specifically does biological control of invasive weeds. But uh, we had a new professor join us recently, Dr. Nicole Quinn, who does biological control of invasive invertebrates. So she's working on the um, citrus mealybug and the ghost bolimulus snail. So if you're interested in keeping up with some of the biocontrol activities of our lab, then you can visit our website um, at irec.ifis.ufl.edu forward slash BCRCL. Um, so I definitely want to acknowledge everyone in my lab because this is a team effort. Um, we recently, our funding agencies, Board of Fish and Wildlife, FDAX, the Department of Agriculture, USDA APHIS, and the Florida Invasive Species Council, especially the Kathy Craddock's Burke Education Grant, which we received, which has helped us um, pay for uh, some of the extension and outreach material that we are going to be distributing at um, outreach event, and we will be distributing to county extension offices. Um, I will be putting those documents in the chat also for everyone to download. Um, I've got the brochure, so you can have that on it if you feel like glancing through it. Um, and again, here is the QR code for our iNaturalist project and emails for all three of us on the project. Again, I'm Emily Lafaustier. Sarah Salgado is one of the other graduate students on the project and Dr. Carrie Mentier, who is my boss. Um, if you have questions about biocontrol or in, uh, invasive species, email any of us and we'd be happy to try to answer your questions. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. Great, Emily. We're excited to help you with this project. So we've got a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to hit you with a couple real quick 
Um, are there any other acacias that are invasive in Florida? Not that I know of. I, I think the only acacia that we have that is invasive is this one, earleaf acacia. Okay. Um, and then how are you going to determine the release sites? Is it going to be density? Is it going to be location, private property, public property, these sort of questions? Yeah, it's going to be a mixture of all of the above, right? So it's going to depend on our funding sources. Um, obviously, if we get grants um, from or county grants, where we would focus on county lands, um, the first releases are going to be much more controlled than um, the Air Potato Challenges were. So Air Potato Challenge came along um, much later in the game um, as a need to help homeowners. So what I'm saying is basically, I don't think we're going to go to homeowners' properties right away and release uh, our insects because we want to have a chance to study them, to um, see what they're doing before they before they start spreading everywhere and people start releasing them everywhere. We want to get some of that good information. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a two part and I know you addressed this, the questions came in before you talked about it, but, um, you know, of course, many people worried about non-target species being, um, you know, attacked or being, um, eaten by these insects. Um, and so the question, you know, they're wondering if it's going to spread to others and, you know, with the air potato beetle, we just have, it's just been so excellent. And there's many um, other species in that, even in that, um, in that family that we didn't have any non-target effects of that biocontrol agent. So that's just one success story there, of course. And if you, the government is not going to allow you to release a insect, um, that is going to have, uh, that's not going to be super specific, right? But right. so Susan Painter is wondering, how do you determine that an insect is only feeding on the invasive species? So what does that look like? What does that look like in the lab? Yeah, that's a good question because um, our facility is a quarantine facility and it seems very mysterious from the outside, right? Um, and so that's why I like to talk about uh, biocontrol and what we go through in the testing process. So what we do is we put our insects on in cages on on these plants, uh, potted plants, and we give them the choice to eat or die. And it's been 100% of the time that these insects have chose to die when the plant is not early ficasa. And so uh, we use um, a very successful testing method where we start with it's the centrifugal phylogenetic method. So a big fancy term for we test all of the closest relatives first before we go on to other um, economically important, ecologically important species. Um, so yeah, that's why we've been doing a lot of testing on our native Bachelias um, thing because Acacia has been going through a lot of renaming. Um, we and I personally have been doing a lot of these tests. So um, there's multiple labs on this project that have been doing their due diligence, making sure that there's not gonna be any non-target effects, no no feeding on other plant species. So, um, and if the case were to be that our insects would feed on another plant, we would put them in a, another set of experiments it wouldn't automatically exclude them unless it was uh, a native endangered species or something like that. But the chances of them eating anything else that is not in a case are slim to none. Okay, awesome, great response. Um, and then um, I think we probably should talk about a couple of things. Um, somebody wanted to know if Malaluca was invasive, and I know you had it up there. And and how yeah. is the biocontrol and the other types of control working on the Malaluca? Yeah, so the um, Malaluca was a little bit before my time, but I'm familiar with it because uh, a lot of our collaborators have worked on that project. And the Malaluca biocontrol agents have done an excellent job in keeping the populations in check. But the thing about biocontrol that I think... Um, we need to manage our expectations. 
so they are not the silver bullet that's going to take out but they're not going to remove the problem completely they're going to be another tool in our toolbox to help us manage these invasive species so it will help us eliminate a lot of the plants, but not all of them. And that's important because that's what's going to help maintain populations so that they can spread to take care of other um, populations of the tree. Um, so that combined with mechanical and chemical control has really been major, at least in our area, to manage Malaleuca. Yep. And um, unfortunately, I think what they're finding is when management is not paired with restoration effort, we get this invasive treadmill. So basically, Malaluk is down, but earleaf acacia is coming right in to take its place. Mm. So it, it's taking a, uh, it has, it's a lot of diligence that needs to be, uh, unfortunately, it, it's a lot of extra work. But mm. yeah, Malaluka, they have, it's been very successful. The agents are very yeah, so it really is about it puts a lot of responsibility on those land managers, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, Vita Bauer wanted to rem remind us that flora mulch is made from Malaleuca. So that's a mulch that is chopped up Malaleuca trees, which is a positive. Um, Heather asked, um, you stated that the bugs uh, could either eat or die in the lab there. Um, and she wants to know, are you um, looking at all stages of the plant, seeds, roots, juvenile plants, mature plants, you know, et cetera? How do you evaluate for the life stages of those plants? That's a good question. Uh, so our insects are leaf feeders. So we're putting them on leaves to see if they eat, um, but they there's no reason to think that they would eat seeds or roots of the plants because that's just not in their biology to feed on. Now, if they were to eat the leaves, certainly we, we would put them on the other parts of the plant to see if they would eat it, but we've got no reason to think that biologically um, that they would want to eat those plants. Okay, okay great. Those question. parts of the plant, sorry. Right, right. Um, now here's a sticky subject and I don't know if you have waded into these waters or not. Um, the question about honey and some of these invasive plants serving as nectar sources uh, for honeybees. Um, and is earleaf acacia one of those? And you know, how do we how do we kind of talk about that message as like as far as like Brazilian pepper goes? Yeah, so this is the territory that uh, Dr. Mentier has uh, dove headfirst into because okay. this is a very important conversation. Honey is a very important commodity to, and it's a, a life, you know, the lifeblood of a lot of people's businesses. So certainly it's something to consider. Um, I haven't heard of early case of um, being a concern for beekeepers, but that's okay. just me. Uh, mm -hmm. Brazilian pepper tree, Chinese tallow tree, and more northern Florida, certainly. Um, but at least in our neck of the woods in South Florida, there are so many other plants that are native species, especially that are in flower at the same time that Brazilian pepper tree is, okay. for one. Um, and for two, we're not eliminating Brazilian pepper tree from the landscape. Um, in a perfect world, that would be the case. But I think beekeepers can rest assured that the, the nectar sources are not going to be eliminated completely. But we're just trying to do add another tool to the toolbox to manage the plant to see if we can't help slow the spread. And I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of damage that can be done by this plant. Mm -hmm. So I think that needs to be, we need to consider both equally. Yeah, the conversation continues on that. Uh, we yeah. have somebody from the honeybee lab in uh, later on in the year, and we'll pose that question to them at that time. But it's interesting, you know, that one man's trash is another man's treasure in that yeah. case. So <laughs> we have to be, we have to be, just be aware of the issues, which is good. Yeah, absolutely. Um uh, Basim from um, Seminole County is um, asking about Moringa. I don't know if you know that tree very well. I um, don't, but I would venture to guess it would be on the, um, the website. That, yeah, yeah, I can pull it back up so they can 
on this yeah. uh, Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. It's website. either on that it would be or there. the one that we use as Master Gardener Volunteers is the IFAS Assessment of Non-Native Plants. Yep. Um, and that's that's our ruling body, everyone. That's mm -hmm. the one we use. Um, she also the, um, the the Center for Aquatic and Invasive should be in line with that. It normally yep. is. They are updated at the same time. Um, the FLEPC list and the FISC list may vary, but as IFAS Master Gardener volunteers, we use the IFAS assessment of non-native plants. And yes. Basm moringa is still on that list, and you need to check and see whenever you're making any recommendations or referring to it um, what the current status is because things come off the list and things come on the list. So we have to be careful when we're checking on that. Yeah. So um, FLEPSI is now uh, has been renamed. It's FISC, so the Florida okay. Invasive Species thank Council. Thank you. And I'm an old have, timer. Thank you for keeping I know, up with me. <laughs> I joined that a long time when it was FLEPSI, um, but they have. Their plant list is from 2019. So at our meeting this year, we're going to be discussing updating that, I believe. Uh, we're due for an update, but, you know, COVID put a wrench in that. But yeah. Sure. Okay, great. Um, and um, this is a question about this invasive biology kind of thing. Um, Maria asks, in the case where the air potato beetle has been introduced, is it necessary to eradicate the air potato still in those areas too? Or will the potato beetle, you know, the, the uh, air potato beetle eat it all the way down? Um, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so they, they will complement each other. So, you know, biocontrol, they're never going to eliminate their food source. So if the population of the plant declines, the population of the insect declines in response. But then when you have these outbreaks of the invasive plant, so be it the bulbs or the vines themselves, the insect populations uh, rise back again in response. So um, there is there, that's always discussing whether a second or third or fourth insect biocontrol agent is needed um, when one has been so successful. And I, I don't think having the second one that eats a different part of the plant, it, I don't think it's a, a bad thing. Um, I, I support what our collaborators have done in the, in the lab in Fort Lauderdale and in Gainesville, um, being that in some areas, air potato has problems establishing, or the air potato beetle has problems establishing. It could be, um, and what we've seen sometimes is that mosquito control um, in these more urban areas Interesting. Interesting. affects the air potato beetles. But if they are, if there's a beetle that is eating the bull bill, then maybe they may not be influenced by mosquito sprays. So I, I think we need to look at it from that angle that they're complementary of each other. Yeah. Yeah, Maria, keep picking up potatoes and getting rid of them in your regular trash. Um, um, uh, Carla is asking, could you tell us again what the bloom time is on the early facacia? Sure, I'll go back. Um, the literature says it, it varies. So, um, I think it just got through being in bloom in our area. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're starting to see seeds now. I apologize for, I'm just so kind of like late fall, early winter. Right. Because the ones I saw in Southwest Florida were just about wrapped up with their bloom. Right. Okay, here we go. June through January. Well, no wonder they're so prolific. That's a long bloom time. A very, and I mean, it, it varies. So each tree, you know, one tree might start and the tree next to it may not start for another month or two is what we've noticed. So it, it really, it varies. But um, I find in the late summer is when I'm starting to smell them and see them. And that I think that's, the, that's the time to start recognizing them. And I think when uh, hopefully after leaving this presentation, you all have a better idea of what it looks like. I would be so thankful if you would join our iNaturalist or make reports on EdMap. Um, iNaturalist now feeds uh, the information gets uploaded directly into EdMap. Um, and if you're not familiar with iNaturalist, it's a free platform that you can use on your smartphone. Um, I push it because I, I enjoy it as a hobby personally. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm walking, I'm just taking pictures of things that I don't know about. And I've learned so much doing that. <laughs> but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it can vary. But the we 
I don't think we have a whole lot of plants that look like this. So it's very distinct. It is quite distinct. Once you get a search image on, you'll be able to see it pretty easily. Uh, yeah. uh, Nico wants to know what it, what the fragrance, sm fragrance smells like. I, I wish I could describe it. <laughs> I can't. Okay. Um, there, it could be, I think I've read that other species of acacia are used for perfume. Um, I wouldn't wear it as a perfume oh. personally, but. No, because you'd be I, worried I, about the beetle coming after you. Well, that might be a good thing. They're awful cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. We have um, Denise is saying uh, how, you know, can the master gardeners help more? We just, and this is sort of just underlining the reminder to you that we are very active. We're all over the state. Should you need us to help rear or house or, you know, do something with, uh, with the insects, with the biocontrol or spread the word, um, please, please stay in contact with me and I'll get the information out to the coordinator so we can help more. Um, but to Denise, you know, to help also is to make sure that people are aware of this invasive plant, that they are alerted to what it looks like and know that it's invasive and not going to share it. And, um, and then let people know that there is a biocontrol agent coming down the pike um, yep. in the future for this plant. Yes, um, and when this agent, uh, when we get the petition in um, for release, I'm hoping that we will be able to spread the word. Um, every biocontrol agent goes through public comment period. So anybody, their their mamas and their, their grandmas, they can all go and, you know, read through the petition and write on a public forum exactly how they feel about it. And um, the one of the best things you guys can do apart from helping us map it right now is to just keep up, you know, watch for our updates and show your support and, and ask questions if you're not sure, if you don't feel confident. I feel very confident in the work that we do because I've been doing it so long and I'm, I'm a part of the process. Um, and Dr. Mentir is, an excellent researcher who um, takes risk very seriously. And I, I can say that about all of us, all of the biocontrol practitioners here in Florida, we all take our jobs very seriously. So to have the support of uh, Master Gardeners and to anyone else in the public is, is a huge honor and we take that very seriously. Good, good. So um, two things I'm going to ask you to do, if you could go back to the QR code so people can link to that um, on Iron iNaturalist I through their, um, through the slide. Um, so, and Cindy asks, how can we be on a list to receive updates on invasives? Uh, you can just um, follow the IFAS assessment of non-native plants. You can go go there. We, they don't do an update list. I've asked them to do that, Cindy. So um, I don't know how much louder I can scream for an update on that, but the, it goes into a well. So we just uh, routinely have surprise parties when we visit that website. And um, so hopefully we can move past that at some point. And then Carla is asking, what's the name of the beetle again? It is Calamella intimorata. So I'll go up to the slide so you can look at it and then I'll come back to the QR code again. Okay. Calamella intimorata. Yep. And listen, Emily, if you need anyone to travel to Australia to look for other biocontrol agents, I'd like my name to be put on the short list there. I'll go with you guys and we'll go look for yeah. some other insects. Yeah. Listen, all of us are on the short list here. We're all eager to, <laughs> to go back. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. And then uh, let's wrap up with this. Um, uh, if, if people see invasive plants on natural lands, um, what should they do? So iNaturalist is a good feature. I promote that, like I said, because I enjoy it. And I think the user interface is, is very user-friendly. Um, but also you can reach out send a picture, send uh, a DPS point to your natural resource extension agent if you have one in your county or, um, you know, report it to somebody. And I think the environmental protection department or your natural lands department of your county yeah. or your city. And many times when I've done that, I'm like, oh, you know, there's, there's Chinese tallow over here. 
um, they'll say, yes, we already know that, or thank you for bringing that to our attention. So right. it, is, it is useful. There are kind of the eyes and the ears out there. And I also will tell you, if you see one or two of something, pull it up, you know? Yeah. It, if it's be the, the change feelings, you want to see in the world, right. if you're a hundred percent certain that that is what the plan is, you know, I bet Emily yeah. does that when she's out and about. I do. I pluck them and pot them so I can use them <laughs> later. <laughs> All right. Well, we know to reach out to you and your lab uh, around all things ear leaf, acacia, biocontrol, and please let us know when that biocontrol agent um, has been cleared and has got the green light. Um, yes, absolutely. For your other questions about um, invasive plants, I'm going to ask you to um, contact your extension agent directly on that um, because we have run out of time. So, uh, Emily, we appreciate you and uh, good luck with your studies and with your thank program. You. And uh, please tell the lab we all said hi. Yeah, thank you all for your time and for joining me today and listening to me ramble on about invasive species. But I, I know you all have a very, you all have a love for Florida, just like I do. So thank you again for the opportunity. Okay, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.